today he seems like the likely next prime minister. And people always criticize him only on policy and not on ethics. Luckily, you have your own work who isn't going to let him get away with that. Uh, so please welcome your own work. Is that Thank it? You. Thank you, thank you all for coming. This is my uh, first talk for the Tax uh, Alliance, so uh, thank you guys for, for having me. And they do great work, so uh, to the extent that you can, support what they do. Um, so, today on campuses, uh, we find that the most, you know, the most exciting, um, the most motivated group of students seem to be those students supporting Corbyn. Uh, you know, if you looked at the, if you looked at the um, numbers coming out of the last election, I mean, it was unbelievable. It was oh, well over 60% of UK students voted for Corbyn, right? Voted for the Labour Party, not just any Labour Party, right? Not the Labour Party of the 1990s, but the Labour Party of the 1960s was popular, was immensely popular on campuses. As you went through the age groups, it was fascinating, right? As you went through the age groups, the support for labor declined a little bit. Once you got to really old people, that's where the conservatives did really, really, really well. If you look at American politics, you're seeing the same basic phenomenon. Bernie Sanders was incredibly popular among college students. He easily, easily won the college student vote. And one wonders, if the election had been between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who would have won? I suspect Bernie would have had a great chance of actually winning that election. So 150 years or so after Karl Marx wrote his famous books, you know, uh, 27, eight years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we're seeing a resurrection of socialism. Over almost 40 years now, since uh, a little bit, what is it, over 40 years since Margaret Thatcher came to power, redid Amer British politics. Ronald Reagan came to America and redid American politics. Berlin Wall comes down. It's the end of history, we're told. Because collectivism, socialism, communism, we're dead, finished never to be resurrected again, and so-called liberal democracies were now going to rule the day. So what happened, I think, we need to ask ourselves. How did we get from there to here? Why is socialism on the rise again? And what can we say about socialism? What should be our evaluation of socialism? Young people think it's great. Why? Where does that come from? Because let's do a quick history, and my guess is that this group doesn't need uh, much history when it comes to uh, what socialism has brought to the world. But what is the essence of socialism? What is the fundamental philosophical core of the socialist idea? What does it uphold? What does it raise above all else? Quality. What's that? Quality. Equality, right? So the socialist idea at the core is about everybody having equal outcome. And what does this equality assume? What does it reject? It rejects the value of whom? Of the individual. So the essential of socialism is the group above the individual and the group, the group must be a group of equals, equal in outcome, equal in how they live, equal not in rights, not in freedoms, but in wealth, in uh, consumption, in how we live, in outcome. Those are the essential characteristics of socialism. Where has this, this been practiced? Where has this been tried? Well, everywhere. Everywhere. It's been tried in its most extreme or most consistent form, obviously, in the Soviet Union, where we know what happened. What happened? 
Maybe we don't know what happened. Certainly those kids at the universities don't know what happened. Somewhere north of 100 million people died. Of starvation, of basically just slaughter, uh, in the gulags, in, in, in camps. Not that dissimilar to the camps, to the Nazi camps of the Holocaust. All in the name of what? Of equality. Of the individual doesn't matter. It's okay for you to be killed. It's okay for all these people to die because individuals don't matter. What matters is that ultimately one day the collective, the proletarian, will thrive. We'll live in this utopia, this wonderful world. To achieve this dream of utopia, they had to kill a hundred million people. And one has a sense they only got started, that if, if, if they had stayed as brutal, they would have killed many, many more. It was tried in China. Right? Same thing tried in China, Mao Zedong, a slightly different version, more Asian, if you will. But still, the idea is the same. Everybody is the same. The individual doesn't matter. Sacrificing as many individuals as we need to in order to achieve the dream is okay. So how many did they kill in China? So anyway, I, I understand about 60 million who starved to death yeah. um, in the Cultural Revolution. Well, before the Cultural Revolution, actually. But, but yes, anywhere between. It depends on, the, on who you read and the estimates. But this is where it gets you know, kind of weird, right? And dark and strange, because we're, we're quibbling between somewhere between 40 to 80 million people. As if 40 is a small number, and 80 is the shocking one. <clears throat> 40 to 80 million people were starved or just killed in order to achieve a dream of equality, a dream that relied on the idea that the collective, the group, is what's important. And we can kill individuals, because at the end of the day, they don't matter. What matters is this happiness, well-being, prosperity of the group one day in the distant future. This is the legacy of socialism. Now, if that isn't evil, I don't know what is. That is evil. Now, the socialists tell us, oh, well, that isn't real communism. That's, you know, that was Stalin, that was, they're nuts, they were crazy, they were dictators, that's not real communism. Real communism is what? It's placing the collective above the individual, and it's a dream of perfect equality. Now, if you look around the room, uh, anybody here equal to anybody else in any significant thing about them? Well, we're now with different heights, with different weights, with different levels of intelligence, with different levels of motivation. We're different in every characteristic one can imagine. We're different. I mean, there's certain things that are the same, and that's what makes us human. But once you accept that we're human, we're different. That's the reality. That's metaphysics. That's not social construct. It's metaphysically true that we are all different, with different abilities, capabilities, motivations, skills, education levels, and almost everything else. What happens when you take a group of people who are different and try to make them the same? Well, we know what happens because they tried in the Soviet Union, they tried in China, and maybe the most extreme example of this, maybe the one that was the most explicit, was a, a story you know I, I've told I've told before, and uh, some of you might have heard this, and it's it's in my latest book. But it's a group of intellectuals who are studying in Paris uh, under the great philosophers, French philosophers, uh, you know, uh, Diderot and Sartre and existentialists, and all the egalitarian philosophers, and they they took this seriously, and they wanted equality, equality of outcome, real equality. They wanted people to be equal. So they went back to their country and they actually gained political power in their country. And uh, they, they looked around and they said, yeah, people are not equal, what are we gonna do? Right? Some people live in cities, some people live in the countryside. So how do you make people equal? You empty the cities. 
You drive everybody into the countryside. But you know, even in the countryside, people are not equal. Some people can read, some people can't. Some people have, uh, you know, wear glasses, which is a sign of education. Some people don't wear glasses. Some people are good foragers for food, because they were foraging for food. They were so hungry, right? Some people are not good foragers for food. What do we do? How do we make them equal? Well, we can't. You can't take away an education from somebody. You can't take away their skill to read and write. You can't take away their intelligence. You can't take away their motivation. So what do you do? If you want a population that's all equal, and if the collective is your standard and the individual doesn't matter, what do you do? Kill people. You kill them. So if you wore glasses, you were shot. If they knew you had an education, you were shot. If you were a good forager, a good farmer, a good anything, you were shot. In Australia, they have a term for this, you know, chop down the tall poppies. You don't want to see those tall poppies up there, chop. Well, these guys did it. This was the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. These are the killing fields of Cambodia. This is two million people out of a population of somewhere between five and six million. 40% of their own people they shot in order to achieve equality. Socialism. That's all they were doing. They were good socialists. And, you know, we were talking about Noam Chomsky before, but Noam Chomsky, the, the, the uh, famous, uh, probably most cited American intellectual of the last 50 years, was an apologist for the Khmer Rouge for years and years and years after all this came out. Why? Because they were trying to achieve a noble good. So their means, yeah, they screwed up a little bit on the means. But the goal was good. So he have obviously the most extreme forms. <clears throat> so we say, well, they're not real socialists. But they are. They are exactly the real socialists. If you read Marx, they're implementing exactly what he wanted implemented. And if you read Marx's letters, Marx was not shy about the need in on the way to utopia to eradicate a lot of people. He's completely open about that. So actually certain races he didn't like and thought, I think the Slavs were on his list of, of, of ones that could never become proletarian. They could never get into that mode of, of, uh, of, of being part of this collective. Yeah, but they're moderate socialists. What about the moderate socialists? Right. Well, what if, what's the success story of moderate socialism? Well, uh, Chavez in Venezuela was a moderate socialist. I mean, he wasn't Stalin, and he wasn't, he wasn't Mao, and he, and he certainly wasn't Pol Pot. So, you know, what did he do? He basically, uh, you know, the oil, oil company had already been nationalized before he took over. But, he, but he, he nationalized all the oil services industries around the oil fields. And then he, and then he nationalized and turned into collective farms, all the farming businesses. I mean, nothing wrong with that, right? That, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's just plain, vanilla, simple socialism, right? I mean, what does Corbyn want to do? He wants to nationalize some stuff. Nationalization is a core to this, and it's good for the country, and it's for the group, and it's for the collective, and to hell with the individuals who owned it. They don't, they don't matter. And ultimately, is this central planning better than each of us doing our own thing and all this chaos running around there in the marketplace? If we could plan how many tomatoes or potatoes or lettuce we needed to make, wouldn't that make more sense? Well, you see how much sense it makes by the fact that today in Venezuela, people are literally starving. Little babies are dying of malnutrition in Venezuela. Now, let's, let's put this in context, right? Venezuela has more oil reserves than any country on the planet, more than Saudi Arabia. They just can't access them because when they nationalized everything to do with the oil fields, they lost all the technology and the ability to innovate and the ability to stay on top and to go out and explore and find all the oil. The oil is there, they just need to go get it. They don't have the capital, they don't have the resources, they don't have the ability. So oil is drying up. There's no food. We're talking about a country that is one of the most fertile countries in the world, certainly in Latin America. Used to export food before the farms were nationalized. But you know what? It turns out, it's funny, it's kind of weird, 
the collective farms in Ukraine and collective farms in China and collective farms in Venezuela and I'd even say collective farms in Israel don't work. They don't produce the goods. Nobody cares. We're going to try it again because we should next time it'll work. Einstein had something to say about uh, what do you call uh, somebody who uh, tries to do the same thing over and over again expecting different results? That's insanity. And yet, socialists are insane. Because everything that everything the socialists are attempting, everything they claim to want has been tried before. There's not a single original idea that they have that somebody has not tried around the world and has uniformly, without any exception, failed at it. I mean, yes, Scandinavia, right? This is what they all fall back to. But Scandinavia! But Sweden is wonderful, right? I hear that all the time. And of course, uh, when uh, Bernie Sanders wanted to give people a model of socialism, he didn't use Venezuela. That he would have done 10 years earlier when he was praising Chavez, when Jeremy Corbyn was praising Chavez to the hilt. They all point us to, to, to Scandinavia. But every, everybody should know the history of Scandinavia. I mean, it's pretty simple, certainly of Sweden. Sweden's history is very straightforward. From 1870, or approximately 1870, until 1960, Sweden had the freest economy in the entire, probably in the world, or close to it. It was probably freer than the United States. It had rule of law, protection of property rights, and basically laissez-faire, or as close as we've come to laissez-faire. And you know what? They became the richest country in all of Europe. On a per capita GDP basis, Sweden was the richest country in all of Europe. They had, I think it was four of the ten largest companies in Europe were based in Sweden. And in 1960, they decided to adopt socialism. And they took all their wealth, a lot of it, and they started redistributing it. And by 1979, what was the largest industry in Sweden? Anybody know what the largest industry is? The largest money maker in Sweden in 1979? Yeah. Abba. Abba. Anybody remember ABBA? ABBA? The rock group? ABBA? Waterloo? I remember watching the Eurovision where they won. Um, 1972 or 73 or something like that. They won with Waterloo. Um, ABBA was the largest thing. You know what number two was? 1979? Johan Borg, a tennis player, who then got up and left and went to, I don't know, uh, Luxembourg or something because he didn't want to pay the taxes. Industry had gone from Sweden. Sweden no longer had the largest companies in Europe. They had collapsed. By 1994, Sweden was what Greece was a few years ago. They were bankrupt. They were finished. And since 1994, Sweden has been liberalizing their economy, has been freeing it up, has been reducing regulations, has been cutting down on redistribution of wealth. It still redistributes a lot. It's still regulated. But relatively speaking, it ain't socialist any more than America is socialist. It spends more on redistribution than the United States does. It regulates more than Amer uh, less than the United States does. So it's got a different balance. All our, uh, most of our economies today are these mixed economies. Some capitalism, freedom, some socialism, government intervention, control. And Sweden has a slightly more government-oriented mixture than the United States but not overwhelmingly so. It's not socialist or America's capitalist. America's not capitalist, and Sweden's not socialist. They're both mixed economies, with some of each. But even when Sweden, homogeneous Sweden, with all the smarts of Swedes, and all the collective love they have for each other, supposedly, couldn't make socialism work in Sweden. They went bankrupt. It's never worked anywhere. Anywhere. Israel, I grew up in Israel. I grew up in Israel uh, during a period when it was socialist. The largest employer in Israel in those days was the labor union. The labor union owned the means of production. They owned the factories in which their people worked. And Israel, you know, was a poor country and relied extensively on support from Jews all over the world and from, you know, 
other countries and German reparations and all kind of other stuff. I, you know, they innovated, they're smart people, they're hard working because they, they, their existence depended on it, so they, they survived. But they survived. You know, it was a poor country when I grew up. Over the last, I don't know, 40 years, a little under 40 years, from basically from the day I read Atlas Shrugged, um, <laughs> it turns out that it's, it's close. Israel has been slowly liberalizing its economy. I read Atlas Shrugged in 1977. That was the first year where non-Labor Party won the election. That it was 1977. Every election up until that point in Israel's history, the left had won. And they've been liberalizing. Now, they're no, they're no bastion of capitalism, right? But they are far removed from socialism revolt. And what's happened in Israel? They've become rich. They're doing unbelievably well. Every time I go to Tel Aviv, I go, whoa, I don't even recognize this place. Skyscrapers and cranes and industry. And they are the number two place for high tech in the world after Silicon Valley. Why? Because we've unleashed some capitalist forces there. Socialism fails everywhere. And yet, it's incredibly popular. It's incredibly popular. It's like one of these uh, sports teams that loses all the time, and yet the fans never abandon it. But here, it's much, 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 much worse than that, right? Because here you suffer real consequences. It's not just the emotional pain of your team losing. It's if you embrace, if Corbyn comes to power and, and does what he says he'll do, which is, you know, I doubt he'd actually do it, but if he did it, and oh, if Bernie Sanders came to power and actually did, we would all suffer. All the people who voted for him would suffer. And they know that, and they could see that if they only looked at history, if they only examined the facts. There are real consequences. This isn't a game. Look at Venezuela. They have no, you know, there are no dogs and cats in Caracas anymore. Because they've eaten them all. The zoos were broken in relatively early, and all the animals there were eaten. It's hard to imagine how the richest country in Latin America 30 years ago has become the poorest country in Latin America in the span of 30 years, all because of socialism. And nobody cares. How many stories do you see about Venezuela? And how many stories do you see about Venezuela that actually point to the socialism as the cause? The left has come up with 3,000 excuses. They excuse Stalin. They excuse the Soviet Union. They excuse Mao. And now they're in the excusing Venezuela. They excuse uh, Pol Pot. They excuse them all. Every single one of them. And you can be a communist in polite company. Right? You can go to a cocktail party and somebody say, yeah, I'm a communist. Everybody say, oh, cool. And then, you know, how's that? Working for you or whatever, right? Go to a party and say, I'm a Nazi. Right? Spit in your face. They'll throw you up. Now, I think justifiably. I'm all for spitting in the face. Well, not spitting. But throwing people out of parties who are Nazis. But why do we treat Nazis differently than the communists? Indeed, communists have killed many, many more people than Nazis. Their ideology is just as evil and just as bad. It's the same ideology, in a sense. The Nazis, remember, were national socialists. But what the Nazis did is they took socialism, the collective is what matter, the individual doesn't matter, and they added a racial element to it, which is, you know, adding evil on top of evil. But the essential is the same. The group is what matters, my group, not your group, my group is what matters, and everybody else, you know, can be killed. But it's the group that matters and the individual doesn't. It doesn't matter. And we kill as many individuals as we need to in order to achieve some dream, some utopia for the group. So, in my view, any, anything, that, anything that claims to be socialist is not just bad. It's not just wrong. It's evil because it is advocating for defeat. It's advocating for pain. It's advocating for death, whether they're willing to acknowledge it or not. It's what it means. It's what it's always been in practice. Now, if you were a socialist 100 years ago, I could give you slack. Maybe even 50 years ago, because we didn't know, know the full extent of what was happening. 
But you cannot be a socialist today and be innocent. Now, again, I give anybody under 25 slack. Jeremy Corbyn's not under 25, neither is Bernie Sanders, neither are a lot of these people. Their ideology is an evil ideology. Now, what's the standard of evil? How do we define evil? Because, granted, if Jeremy Corbyn comes to power, we're not going to have concentration camps. I don't think. Right? Same with Bernie Sanders. So it's not the death and that, that is the essence, just the, the only thing that makes it evil. What makes it evil? What's the, what's the criteria for evaluating what is evil and what is good? Well, my criteria is whether it's good for human life or bad for human life. That which promotes human life is the good. That which promotes human flourishing is the good. That which destroys human life, that which destroys human flourishing is evil. Socialism, everywhere it's tried, destroys the capacity, the ability to flourish, to be successful as an individual human being. And therefore, it is evil through and through. So we're left with this puzzle, if everything I've said is true. Why is it so popular? Because it is unbelievably popular. <laughs> And I think, there, I think there are two reasons, one more superficial and one deeper, though. You, know, you could argue there are more than two, but we'll, we'll focus on two. The first is ignorance. People are just ignorant. And our educational system, I think, works hard to keep them ignorant. And we, we could ask the question, why does it do that? Which is an interesting question, but it does. Particularly in America, I have a feeling the same is here, but less so, but the same. From K, from kindergarten through high school, the educational system, we don't really teach history. We whitewash it, we, 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 we distort it, we pervert it, particularly right now. You know, if it, the, the West, according to our intellectuals today, is evil, anything the West has done is bad, anything other peoples have done is good, and everything is distorted based on this, these new postmodern, if you will, uh, uh, lenses that people have. So they don't know. A lot of young people just don't know. And when they do know, Stalin killed this many people, Mao killed the, they don't connect to two ideas. It's Stalin was a bad guy. Hitler was a bad guy. Mao was a bad guy. Pol Pot was a bad guy. Maybe one day they'll recognize Chavez was a bad guy. But there's, it takes an intellectual next step to say, well, what's common to all of them? Oh, they were all socialists. And a teacher's not going to do that in the world we live in today. So a lot of these kids don't know, and sadly enough, they don't have, they haven't been taught to think in a way that allowed them to integrate it and see it for themselves. So if they're not told it, they don't do the integration themselves. But there's a deeper issue. There's a deeper issue, and this relates to the failure of, let's call them, the right. Okay? The people who traditionally have opposed socialism. The fundamental failure is a moral failure. It's a failure to define morality. It's a failure to reject the fundamental ideas of socialism. It's a failure to reject collectivism and the morality in which collectivism rests on. It's a failure not just to reject them, because many people talk about, oh, you know, we, we don't believe in collectivism. But then the real failure is to properly identify what we stand for, or what the right stands for. What's the alternative? What's the alternative to collectivism? Well, in most cases, the alternative to collectivism is a different kind of collectivism. So what you get is collectivism on the left fighting collectivists on the right. But there are very few and far between people who oppose socialism because they are pro-individualism. They are pro-individual life. They are pro the right of individuals to their own life. The idea of individualism has not been defended, has not been articulated, and has not been given wide you know, uh, uh, 
a PO though. As me communicated white. So collectivism for most people today is the standard. And now we're just fighting about which kind of collectivists. And the socialist collectivist is just a little nicer than the right-wing collectivists. And they're more, what do they call what the word now that the right hates? Globalists, right? They love that word, right? So it's more global, which means it's more welcoming, it's more embracing, it's, it's nicer. It's just a nicer form of collectivism, rather than the kind of nationalistic, closed off, angry. People on the right are angry. And borderline, often xenophobic, racist, right? Collectivist, right? And sometimes not borderline, sometimes all in racist, right? And young people don't want that. That's ugly. That's, it's, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's unappealing, justifiably unappealing. What we need, and what I think Iran provides, is a moral defense of individualism and a complete rejection of all collectivism. The idea that an individual is the be and end all of, of, of morality, of politics. It's about the individual. It's about the individual's ability to flourish. It's about the individual's ability to live a good life. And to do that, one has to reject the morality that says that your purpose in life is to sacrifice for others. Because your, if your purpose in life is to sacrifice for others, then others are more important than you. And that's, that's in politics collectivism. That implies that group over there that I'm supposed to sacrifice to is more important than me. The whole morality of altruism, and altruism is not being nice to people. It's not being kind. It's not being polite. It has nothing to do with altruism. If you read Augustine Kant, or if you read Kant, right, the category of goal imperative is to sacrifice self for the well-being of others. The well-being of others is your purpose in life, your moral purpose in life. To the extent that you think you might benefit from helping other people, to that extent your action is not moral. To the extent that you think, oh, I might enjoy dishing out the soup in the soup kitchen, it's not moral anymore if you're motivated by anything to do with your own interest. That means the individual, you as an individual are insignificant, unimportant in the big scheme of the world. Philosophy has set it up that way. If my moral purpose in life is to serve you, who's important here, me or you? You, obviously. Now, there's kind of a contradiction here because for each one of you, you're supposed to serve us. So it's not clear, but that's why you ultimately need a supreme leader to tell us how to, how to allocate sacrifices, right? Because we can't do it as individuals because we're not important. We're insignificant. So what we need to advocate for is the importance of the individual. Only individuals reason. Only individuals think. Only individuals can discover the truth. They can learn from one another. They can benefit one another. But nobody can think for me. Nobody can know stuff for me, only I can know, or not, for myself. The individual is the only moral agent. I need to decide how to live my life. And the purpose of my life should be my life. Staying alive is a good start. And then living the best life I can live. It's the moral purpose of my life. It's to flourish. It's to succeed at living as a human being, which means using my mind. Because that's the tool that we have that makes us human. So, socialism falls apart because why should I sacrifice for the proletariat? Or for this group, or that group, or any group? And why should you sacrifice for me? Nobody has a right to demand anybody's sacrifice. If we believe in the sanctity of individual life, if we believe in a morality that says your purpose in life is to flourish, is to make your life the best life that it can be. What is the only political system consistent with that? It's a system that leaves us free to do exactly that. That doesn't try to dictate to us what, is, what our values should be or shouldn't be. What we, how we should act or how we shouldn't act, how we should live and how we shouldn't live. 
the only political system consistent with a morality of individualism is a political system of individualism, which is a political system of freedom. The only enemy of the individual, the only enemy of a rational life, the only enemy of human reason is force, is coercion, is authority, is somebody forcing you to do something you do not want to do. And that's what we have a state for. To stop people from doing that to us. And we have separation of church and state so that the church stops doing that to us because the church has dominated the authority business for a long, long time. But we don't want any kind of church, right? Religious or irreligious. And we don't want crooks and we don't want thieves and we don't want terrorists. We don't want other people using force against us. So we have a government to protect us so that we can be free. Socialism is the negation of that. Socialism is the creation of government so that we can be slaves. Slaves to our brothers. Slaves to whatever the collective that the socialist of the time declares, whether it's the Aryan race or the proletarian or the Cambodian peasants. We are all slaves to that collective which is defined by that particular socialist movement. Socialism is slavery. Capitalism is freedom. And we need to take those words back or, 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 you know, take them away from the left. The left has, does not believe in freedom. Freedom means nothing if the state is there to tell you what you can and cannot do and how to do it and who to sacrifice to. That's not freedom. That is slavery, a form of slavery. So the reason the left is on this scent, in my view, is, is one, nobody's challenged altruism. Nobody has challenged this belief that morality demands sacrifice from the individual. And until you challenge altruism, you cannot be successful in defeating the left. But it's worse than that. Nobody has actually presented an alternative to socialism that will appeal to young people. What is an alternative that, the, that most of the no, and not, not the crazy right, the, the moderate right, if you will, appeal. We don't want socialism. We just want a little bit of socialism. We don't want it all the way. We just want a little bit. You know, capitalism is kind of good, but it's, it's, it's kind of not so good as well. Right? It's got this greedy stuff and this self-interested stuff that we don't want. So we want a mixed economy. The biggest advocates today who are anti-socialists want a mixed economy. I mean, what is, what is May or Trump or Ronald Reagan or any, or even Margaret Thatcher, what did they really want? They wanted less socialism. But not the eradication of socialism. Not an idealistic vision of what true freedom looks like. Nobody's presented that vision. And you know what young people want? They want to believe in something. They want a vision. They want to believe that there is something pure. They're idealists. I know that's a dirty word these days, right? They're idealists. Yeah, I'm an idealist. I hope you're idealists. But we need to define our ideals. My ideal is politically freedom. That means no socialism. That means no redistribution of wealth. That means no regulation of, of businesses. That means freedom. It means the government doing what it's supposed to do. Protect my rights. Leave me alone otherwise. If we projected an ideal to young people rather than, oh yeah, socialism is pretty good in these things, but not so good in those things. Uh, I'll, I'll end with a story from healthcare in the United States, although I suspect that this is the one group where if I attack the NHS, I won't be, uh, uh, I won't be, um, it's like religion in this country, it's bizarre, right? You say anything against the NHS, people go, you know, I feel like I'm gonna be lynched. Um, so we had this whole debate about Obamacare a few years ago, right? Obamacare. And the Republicans were against Obamacare. They really hated Obamacare. And uh, there was an editorial that was published in, uh, I think it's in the Wall Street Journal, by the head of the Republican National Committee. And he wrote how Obamacare is terrible, it's socialism in medicine, all these bad things are going to happen. And he goes on and on, and then he says, you know, but, but, but just be clear. We are going to defend Medicare. We Republicans believe in Medicare. Medicare, Medicare uh, is, um, how do I, well, Medicare is for people over 65, right? So we, we, we big believers in Medicare. Medicare is really good. 
So the next day, so I read the article in the Wall Street Journal, and I'm horrified. And then the next day, the guy's on the radio, and he's being interviewed by NPR, which is definitely a leftist uh, thing. And the interviewer says, so let me understand this. You're saying socialized medicine is wrong, is bad, is evil. That's why you won't vote for, Medic for uh, Obamacare. And he says, yeah, it's terrible. Ugh, it does all these bad things. He says, then why are you okay with socialized medicine for people over 65? Because that's what Medicare is. Right? Be consistent. If you hate socialism, you hate socialism. You can't have a little bit. You can't choose and pick and choose who to sacrifice when. You're just like the lefty when you do that. It's okay to sacrifice young people for old people, but it's not okay to sacrifice, I don't know, middle-aged people for middle-aged people. I mean, I don't know what the difference is. But that Medicare basically sacrifices young people for old people. Either socialism is bad, but then let's be consistent. Let's go all the way. Either sacrificing some people for other people is bad. If it is, then let's go all the way. But if we, the so-called defenders of freedom, or defenders of the market, or defenders of capitalism, defenders of individualism, go halfway, then we're, we've lost before we even started. Young people want ideals. Let's give them ideals that you can really get excited about. What's more exciting than the ideal of freedom? What's more exciting than the ideal of making your life the best life that it can be, of living a great, flourishing, successful, happy life? Thank you. All right, questions. You're supposed to be London, you're not supposed to be sweating like this. Talking about uh, why is socialism so popular, do you think a lot of it has to do with a mindset where a system's intentions or its motivations are more important than the actual results? That seems to be the mentality I tend to face. It's more about what you want than what you actually cause. Yeah, but that's, that's partially, I mean, that's been a, a, a partially a shift because of the failure, right? I don't think Marx viewed it that way. Marx thought you know, within, t within reasonable time frame, you would get to the point where you got the results. So, you, know, he, he, you know, it was going to happen, maybe a generation, but he certainly didn't think it would happen, take forever. And I think because of the failures, they have to shift towards, no, the means, the ends justify the means, and the ends are way out there, and we'll get there one day. And of course, I would argue that the modern socialists, I mean, this, this is a, I mean, not the modern socialists in, in politics, but the modern socialists in academia are not socialists. They're really nihilists. They, what they only care about is the destruction that they're causing. What they really want is to knock people down. What really drives them is hatred and envy. It's not about equality. They know you can't get equality. They don't believe in equality. What they believe in is, is knocking those bastards who've made a lot of money down, or knocking those bastards who are, who are, who are too smart down. You know the kid, there's one kid who loves to build towers and elaborate stuff and really gets upset when the tower knocks down. And then there's the kid who enjoys, literally enjoys, going around and knocking everybody else's towers down. He's, he's the one who became the professor. Because the guy, I mean, because the guy who built the towers went into business. He went to build stuff. I mean, but what, is, what do you do if you only like knocking stuff down? You need to go into demolition, not that many jobs in that. Or you go into academia, which is one big demolition job and the, and the most extensive one in the human mind. Right? But that's what they do. They, they, their motivation is pure nihilism. And this is the, now the postmodernists say it, right? There's no truth. There's no reality. There's no ideal. We, we can't. I mean, they reject Marx. The idea that, that postmodernism is, is, is a Marxist ideology is wrong. They are, the, they are the rejection of Marx. Marx believe in the truth, in an ideal, in something to strive towards. Postmodernism rejects the very idea of an ideal, of something to strive towards. Their whole purpose is to knock everybody down. So, so how, how do you know who to knock down? So they create hierarchies, right? It's called intersectionality today. Hierarchies. And, and at the, at the, at the most oppressed group, uh, black and a certain type of transgender, I, I'm not I, I, knowledgeable enough in the various types of transgender to tell you which, that's the most oppressed group. You have to, oh, and, uh, and I guess, you, well, you can't be female and transgender, something like that, right? And the most oppressive group is white male. 
Right? That, you know, you irredeemable. Now imagine if, um, if some reason transgender black people gain power. Then, then the postmodernists would be against them. Intersectionalism is a method by which they're trying to gain power. Yeah, so let's say they gain power. They gain the power. Then they'll be against them. They're against anybody who is perceived to have any kind of power. And to them, everything is power. Economics is power. Everything is, everything is in terms of power. Right? All they can understand is power. This is why for them, speech is violence, because speech is a form of power, a projection of power, and power is a form of violence, and they can't differentiate between economic power and political power. Everything's violence. And this is why it's okay to beat people up if you don't like what they say. And, and they can excuse that and they can have editorials in the New York Times saying it's okay to beat people up for speaking because speaking is a form of violence. It's all connected, but you see, they're not about truth. There is no truth. They, they claim there is no truth, but try saying something they disagree with you. They'll beat you up. They're about the primacy of emotion and for them, the most important emotion, the emotion that drives them the emotion that animates everything that they do is hatred. And the better you are, the more, the more you achieve, the more you succeed, the more they hate you, and the more they're driven to destroy you. I mean, it's really, really hard for good people to understand this. Because I can't imagine anybody in this room is driven by hate. Or anybody in this room can even understand that as a motivation. But that is the only explanation when you look at what they say and look at what they do. Is that, that they're there to knock stuff down. They, they resent life. They resent the world. They resent human beings. They resent intelligence. They resent wealth. They, you know, they think they want to go back to nature, but they hate nature. Put them in the Amazon and see how long they survive. But they hate nature. Because at the end of the day, they hate their own life. That's the motivating factor. And that's what they're projecting onto everybody else. And these are the professors. And imagine those professors teaching these kids. And the kids absorb pieces of it. You know, the better ones absorb it superficially. They don't really believe it, but it, it kind of, it's fun at the moment, right? And the bad kids absorb it fully, and they become the professors of the future. And this is a process that's been going on, in some extent, since I think Kant, but, but to a, 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 a the, the modern extent, certainly since the 1960s, when the 60s generation then went, became professors and have been entrenched in academia. Yeah. Anthony van der Els. Um, small groups of individuals um, are the people who usually manage to make an impact, an intellectual impact, and stimulate other people. Yes. Um, in this country, Recently, we've had the IEA and the Adam Smith uh, Institute, and on the other side, of course, for many years, we've had the um, Fabian Society. Um, what is ARI, what is the objectivist movement um, in America doing to promote uh, these ideas um, in our country particularly, and perhaps elsewhere in Europe? So I agree completely. Small groups of intellectuals change the world. You, you see this going back to the Greeks. Aquinas changed the world. Thomas Aquinas changed the world within the Catholic Church by bringing Aristotle in. You, you saw in the Enlightenment. I mean, think about a handful of people that we know changed the world. And, and everything we have today is, is to a large extent due to, to their achievements that, again, go back probably to, go back directly to Aristotle and to the Greeks. Um, and ideas drive history. And, and part of the achievement in the UK, in my view, is AI and Adam Smith, but part of the fact that it doesn't seem to hold and it's not radical enough <laughs> is because, to some extent, AI and Adam Smith are not radical enough in, 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 in their philosophy, more so in their politics, but less so in their philosophy. What the Einstein Institute is trying to do is to, to bring those ideas, the philosophical ideas, into the culture. Less so in the politics. Adam Smith and AEI are doing the politics. We're not going to add much. Right? For us, it's about the philosophy. So that means universities for the professors, and it means students at high schools and universities. I, I have a theory. I think it's, I think it, I think it's true. Um, the, the most effective time to get to people with new ideas is somewhere between the ages of 16 and 30. After a certain point, it's very hard to change your mind about anything important in life. 
You've got so much invested in it. And, and there's even certain ideas about how the brain gets calcified in some sense. It's just hard to get those neuron networks to move around and to change. So it's much easier when you're young and it's much easier when those hormones are gushing in and you're rebelling against the world and you don't agree with anything your parents say and you don't agree with anything your teachers say and then I want to give you good ideas at that point. That's my entry point. So, uh, so we do a lot of lecturing on campuses. We're trying to get Ayman's ideas taught at universities in the United States and the UK and, and uh, across Europe. Europe is hard for a variety of reasons. The language being the smallest of them but because it's more continental and there's more opposition. Um, but, but the UK, I think, is, is very promising. When I first came to the UK in my role at ARI, probably 12, 13 years ago, there was nothing here for, in terms of Ayn Rand. You couldn't, you couldn't walk into a bookstore, there were no books. Nobody heard of her, nobody spoke of her. She was never in the newspapers. It, there was just nothing. Today, I mean, The Guardian runs a four-page story on her, and I think it was the front page, and The Economist, just did a cover story on um, uh, 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 entrepreneurs in England shrugging and going to France of all places. You guys are nuts. <laughs> um, but, you know, they use shrugging in the actual shrug sense as if everybody understands exactly what they mean, right? So today she's here. You walk into any bookstore, they've got copies of Ayn Rand's book. So there's been a real change over the last 10, 15 years. And I think it's partially because I started coming. Right? <laughs> I mean, giving talks, engaging, talking to people. We started the Iron Man lecture series six years ago, uh, which, by the way, this year is on November 13th. Mark on your pet calendars, November 13th. I think at Draper's Hall, uh, and I'm giving the talk this year. Um, and, you know, I think, I think getting the books read is mission number one. One of the cool things that's happened over the last two years in UK is that uh, in the A-level politics class now, Ayn Rand is required reading. Um, she's, uh, she's listed as a conservative thinker. Little do they know, but that's okay. Um, but all, all these kids, and then the examin don't tell anybody, but the examination boards how to write like questions for this and how to provide teacher materials. They don't know anything about Ayn Rand. So we approached them and said, hey, we'll provide you with the materials. And they said, great, that's wonderful, thank you so much. So we've provided them all the materials for the teachers to use and the materials by which they will base the examinations on, on the, sec on the module on Ayn Rand. So Ayn Rand hopefully will become even bigger, particularly in the high schools. This year, I did a tour uh, of the seven, seven of the top uh, a private, you know, here you call them public <laughs> high school. It's, it's opposite. Uh, uh, public high schools in uh, in uh, in the UK. So Eton, Harrow, and and um, uh, Oxford Girls School, and Headington, and and uh, and um, West Winchester, and Westminster. So Westminster, just 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 down here, and that's going to become an annual thing. So every year I'm going to come and do a week or two of just going to the high schools because it was great. These kids are smart, they're intelligent, and, and Wood is from Eton. At Eton, I spoke to the politics club. <coughs> Wood is from Eton. So every place I went, I bought a box of all of Ayn Rand's books, all of my books, right, for the library. And, uh, and Wood from Eton is those books have been gobbled up, and that I've converted at least two or three of the students to uh, rabid uh, objectivist or, or libertarian or some, some variant, right? So it's working, it works. It's the, the, the right age, these are the right ideas, and, um, and these are, you know, supposedly the, the best and the brightest, at least the brightest. And uh, so we continue doing that. Uh, we'll continue working with Adam Smith in particular because they've been the most receptive to uh, working with us on, uh, uh, on bringing these ideas to young people. I, when I'm here, I'll be back in November to give the Iron Man talk. I'm speaking at the student, there's a, there's a a growing Students for Liberty movement in, in the UK, and they're having their regional conference here in London on November 11th. So I'll be speaking at that, and they'll have a whole day, it's a whole day of programming. I encourage, uh, encourage you guys to support that and to come. Um, I'm not sure when London, but, it, but it's online. And then I'll be speaking at King's College, at Exeter, uh, and maybe at Southampton, and certainly at Cardiff, and maybe at Plymouth. So I'll be doing a Southwest 
England kind of little tour. Um, I speak regularly at Oxford. So um, Razi mentioned um, that we've got a bunch of objectors coming. Uh, t and I just scheduled Tara Smith to speak at Oxford um, in November for, what, for a philosophy professor and a philosophy seminar type thing. Um, and so we've got this guy who's kind of interested in objectivism at Oxford. So I'm kind, you know, kind of open to it. So he's a Hume scholar. So it's, it's, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on right now, particularly in England. In, in Europe, most of the action is in Eastern Europe. So almost nothing in Western Europe. The Germans, the French, the Italians couldn't care less. <laughs> uh, but when you go to Ukraine, you go, I'm, I'm going tomorrow I leave for uh, Tbilisi, in Georgia. I've got four talks in two days at, at, diff at four different universities in Tbilisi. Um, I then go, well, I'm going to, then I'm going to Azerbaijan in Baku. I, I have no idea what to expect there, so we'll see. Um, uh, and then I end the trip, uh, I'm actually speaking in Paris, which is going to be interesting. Uh, I'm speaking in Paris and, and in Copenhagen, I'm doing a panel with Fleming Rose, uh, but then I'm going to Kiev. And Kiev always get phenomenal receptions. Ukraine, Poland is other place. Huge energy in Poland. So I think Eastern Europe and, and Bulgaria. And I was in Albania last year, and there were all these people listening to my podcast in Albania was like, whoa, what are you nuts? Um, and it turns out that because they lived under communism, they know. You don't have to tell them socialism's evil. They know. Their parents have told them stories. They've lived it. And they know fascism's evil. So they know the two alternatives, because they've lived the two alternatives. And it's not that they know what's true, or, or what the third alternative is. But they know these don't work, so they're looking. And, and the best thing for us, I think, is people are looking. And if you want to find people looking, you go to Eastern Europe. The other place on the planet where, where it's exciting right now is Brazil. Brazil is, um, be, you know, first of all, they, every single politician in the country is on the indictment. Every, I think 75% of the House of Parliaments, the president's being impeached, the current president is on the indictment, um, the Supreme Court, I think, is even, everybody, right? Everybody, corrupt, all of Latin America now, there's these massive corruption scandals. And it, it's causing, and then this was a country where young people, where if you were 12, 13, about six, seven years ago, you were promised the moon. You were one of the bricks. You were gonna be the biggest economy in the world. You had natural resources. You, you were gonna manage your economy like the Chinese, right? And they failed, and they're poor. And there are a lot of young people, lots of them, and they're pissed off because they want to be rich. And they've got the internet, and they can see what the West is like, and they can see what America's like, and they want to be rich. And, and it's exciting, Brazil is exciting, just the energy of the, of the people there, and the energy of young people, and they, they're fed up, you know, and, and they really want change. So I, I think the places around the world where things are really happening, which, which I'm excited about, and we try to leverage it to the extent that we can. <coughs> I'm just going to stop this because I've got to stop over. <clears throat> I was really interested in the uh, the part where you said um, we should remove socialism entirely. Uh, I don't think that's a political, politically feasible thing to do. I think too many people are too invested in things like the National Health Service um, that you're never going to get the political capital to make that happen. So is it worth divorcing the concept of social programs from socialism? Because the core premise of socialism is seizing the means of production. Uh, the NHS, I mean, I think you'd have to be quite generous to term it a means of production, it's a service. And then I agree with Hayek when in the road to certain he said, look, there's nothing anti-individualistic about something like a universal health care. You know, there's, there's nothing that violates anyone's individual liberties in that regard. In fact, for a lot of people, it's going to help them because, you know, they might be down on that. I mean, I personally have relied on it myself. You know, sure. So I, and I'm definitely an individualist. So I can definitely see the appeal and the necessity to have one. And I think that if we can divorce the concepts of socialism and social programs, as long, I mean, I don't see a problem with social programs as long as they're not seizing someone's property. Like you say, you know, certain, like the farms in Venezuela sure. is a perfect sure. example. Sure. Like these people own those things. The government comes and takes sure. them. That's unacceptable to me because it's, it's not protecting private property rights. But if the government needs to set up, say, the NHS, they're not seizing anyone's property, they're not violating, it, violating anyone's individual rights, and it would be politically expedient for us to say, let's keep and support the NHS 
and so let's so, carry on. What do you think? So let's think about that, right? Yeah. They're not seizing anybody's property. So I, I'm. Well, I'm let, let's hypothetically su suggest then. But that, but that's, but that's impossible, right? Because a, if I'm a doctor, pretty much the only place I can work is for the government. Uh, I can that's set up. True with private practice. Yeah, but you can't compete with the government. I mean, they're, they're offering, what? they're offering a good for free. Booster so there are exists. There are few medical quality yes. service. There are few doctors who are private doctors, and a few can exist. Hmm. But you know, I, I I I didn't go to the best medical school, and I you know I I still want to have a private practice, but I'm competing against the product that's being given zero. I would say they've seized my property. They've they've annulled the value of my education. And indeed, when the NHS was created, they had to seize doctors' practices because it was the only way in which they could create the NHS. Of course, they seized doctors' practices, but more than that, how did, how, did, how is it funded? It's funded by seizing people's money. Not by pay, people paying insurance, but by seizing people's money, not based on how sick you are, not based on your, your, what you'll need in the future. It's not insurance. This is just pure seizure of people's money with the promise of providing you with the service. This is pure socialism. It, the means of production doesn't just mean manufacture. It means anything that's a productive activity. Healthcare is a productive activity. Uh, and now, the idea that we can never do away with the NHS that is the idea that I think is, 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 is dramatically mistaken and, and has to be challenged. Because if we can't do it with the NHS, from my view, we've lost. Because it means that, uh, because it means that healthcare will only continue to deteriorate, which it will in the, in the UK. You can tinker with it, you can improve it a little bit, but ultimately, and if the United States adopts, because you guys are free riding off the United States. I mean, nobody tells you this. I tell it to every audience I can. But the whole world is free riding over the fact that we still have some freedom in our healthcare system. So about 48% of American healthcare system is still private, which means 75 to 90% of all medical innovations happen in the United States. It means all experimentation, all the failed stuff that makes possible innovation happens in the United States because we're still free to do it. It means that we pay, we're the only country in the world where consumers are actually paying enough for the drugs to make it possible for drug companies to do research and development. Mm. When America becomes socialist, I mean, you guys should be the biggest advocates for private health care in America, so that we can, so you can continue to free ride off of us. Because we pay for all the R&D, it's our drug, why do we have to pay the most in the world for drugs? Because you guys pay cost. Companies make a little bit off of it. So how are they gonna pay for R&D? Well, somebody has to pay a lot. We pay a lot because the market yeah. So I, I don't. I don't. So my not point. Saying what I'm saying in principle. In, in principle, if a, if a government were to say, right, here, here's a new industry. We're going to create it yeah. using taxpayer money. And I, I, I'm assuming that nobody here is against the idea of paying taxes. I'm against the idea of, of coercing people to pay taxes, particularly for something that the market case can provide. Uh, can provide. Right. So so we could we can, I, I I'm willing to concede. I'm willing to put for another time. Yeah. yeah. The argument about whether you, whether you pay taxes. Or, or whether or not you use coercive taxes for police, military, and judiciary, because I think those have to be provided by the government. I don't think any other entity can provide them. Yeah. But there is no other human activity. There's no other human activity, primarily and particularly, I mean, education, healthcare, and all the others, that the private sector can, cannot and will not provide a much better service. I, I, not even in the same universe as what the government provides. And why? To, to, to realize why one has to understand what the government is. The, the fundamental nature of government is a gun. Yeah. What government is is force. It's a monopoly of force. It's a monopoly of force. Yeah. There's no place for force in healthcare. So for example, but, but that's, what it, that's what the NHS is, right? The NHS is basically says, these are the ways in which we treat your disease. These are the approved by the government ways in which we treat your disease. These are the tests we take and this is how long you have to wait for those tests. And I don't care if you can pay for it or not pay for it. This is this is what happens. Yeah. This is like that's force in healthcare, and it destroys healthcare. Well, the thing, the thing is, you say it's approved approved by government, but I mean, like you know, the private health companies are regulated, so they're also approved by government. Yes. And under yes, force. they should so, be regulated. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, like, they, I I always find the argument from well, this is force. It, I feel it a bit reductive. It's just like well. Yes, but you know, technically everything a government does is yes. force, and we, we so, agree that a government is a necessary thing. So, so I want the government only to do things 
where force is the only way to do the thing that they're going to do. So policing is force. Because every because what is what is the I, I said it during the talk. What makes innovation and progress and success as a human being possible? And that's reason. Yeah. And, and and thinking and, and yeah, yeah. force negates that. When I tell a doctor these are the five things you're allowed to do, he's not gonna think about the sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth things, because there's no point in it. Galileo, once he's in house arrest, is not gonna publish new books. I mean, he doesn't want to be burnt at the stake. There's no, it, it, it suppresses human thought, it suppresses innovation, it suppresses uh, the application of the human mind to the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. So when the government controls education, education by, becomes standardized and stupid. When the government provides healthcare, it becomes standardized and stupid because it's negating the mind of the doctor, the mind of the educator. It takes away their freedom to think outside of the box and to do what they want because what is the penalty? Force. Well, I mean, that, that seems to be jumping a few steps. I mean, like, they, what, nobody's forcing doctors to work anywhere. You know? I mean, they, they can choose to not be doctors and do something else in their lives. They can choose to open a private practice. These, these are all things they have the but, choice but of But you're doing. reversing, you're reversing uh, the, the freedom. Freedom, which is my ability to do whatever I want as long as I can find people who will voluntarily deal with me, yeah. right? And then somebody comes in and puts a gun to the back of my head and says, no, you can't deal with this person, you have to deal with that person. And you're saying, well, I could stop being a doctor if that was the case. But, but, well, the, but, the, evil, the, uh, but the evil was that somebody pointed a gun at me. Not that, not that, I, not that I walk away or, can, or don't walk away. Why, why can somebody come and tell me, you can't do this you have to do that. Why does somebody else have authority over my life? If I want to be a doctor, and if I want to treat people in a certain way, who is the guy? And, and people are willing to be treated by me, so I'm not, I'm not forcing them yeah, to be yeah, treated yeah, by no, me. Why is anybody coming in and telling me, you cannot do that? How is that legitimate? But doesn't that delegitimize any kind of government regulation? Yes. Right. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, you don't think there should be any government? No, I, I, I think as long as you are not, either posing as a risk, a, a, a viable risk where they can be proved yeah. to another human being, right. or doing something clearly harmful to another human being, right. you should be left free of all government regulation. Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah, but there'd be no reason to regulate what you're doing if it's not posing any particular risk. But, I mean, you, you could not... Oh, come on, 99% of regulations have nothing to do with well, no, risk. I'm not, I'm not, like, in favor of <laughs> superfluous regulation, yeah. obviously. But it, it just strikes me this is, um, I, I just find it a bit... Unnuanced, I guess. It, like, I don't agree that this is exactly as you're describing it. I guess, I guess I'll have to think about. Well, it is. I mean, think about think about a teacher who, uh, in a, in, a, in a in a system, not let's say in a system not like the UK where you have you have relatively quite a few choices, yeah. but a system like Sweden where all the schools are run by the run by the government. And you have a teacher in Sweden, and you want to start your own school, and and the, you guys have kids who want to come to t attend my school. And the state says no. I mean, well, no, I, I that's, that's, I think, that's, I think that's, yeah. But where's okay? So where's the limit, right? So so um, so you know, if you extrapolate from that, right, you'll agree with kind of some of my extreme examples. Yeah. But all of the, the NHS is exactly the same thing. The NHS forces doctors to behave in ways that doctors do not want to do, because because the government has the ability through force to do that. In a private sector, if they didn't like what the hospital told them to do, they could leave and start their own practice. Here, they can't leave and start their own practice because the government is monopolized. We understand monopoly when it's in the private sector, but here it's a real monopoly, not a private sector yeah, monopoly. It's not monopoly. actually not, though, is it? And that your, your contention was that, oh, you're offering a service free. You know, it's going to be a cheaper sure, service. Sure. But it's also, like you just said, it's going to be an inferior service. You know, a doctor hosting a private practice. He's going to be more attentive to the individual patients. He's going to be better at his job. It's just like with the education. It's a well-known phenomenon in economics that, that that in spite of the fact that the government what the government provides tends to be of inferior quality, agree, yeah. it prices it drives yeah. private capital out. It pri drives private capital yeah. out when it comes to building highways in Latin America. Yeah. And it drives capital out when it comes to schools. And it drives capital out when it comes to sure. to to. to th there's there's no economic and there's no moral legitimacy for the government to be involved in things that it doesn't have to be involved in. I agree with you, you need a government, but yeah. you need a government because of the things it has to do. And the only thing it has to do is military and police and judiciary. It doesn't have to do anything else, and therefore it shouldn't do anything else 
Because by doing it, it violates people's rights. It restricts other people's freedom. Using that gun that it got in order to do policing, it's now using that gun to restrict what I can do. I want to develop a new form of energy that nobody's heard of. I, why, why do I need permission from the stupid EPA, from a bunch of bureaucrats at the EPA, in order to do it? It's none of their business. Okay, well, I, I think... Um, Maybe I'll just, uh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I would like to make a number of comments on your, your talk, but sure. there's two. That, number one, I don't think these students were voting for socialism. They were voting because Corbyn said, I will reduce or uh, get rid of your tuition fees. Yeah. Now, if you're a student, who wouldn't vote for that? Yeah. Obviously they were voting So let me address that. that and then I'll ask you this. I'll let you ask the second question. I don't believe that. I don't believe people vote economics. I don't believe people vote their pocketbook issues. Um, in California, We've had, uh, we've had two referendums now. This is a massive referendum, everybody votes. On whether to raise taxes on the rich or not. And uh, the t they were gonna raise taxes by 30%. And then the second referendum was to make it permanent. The first one was to do it for five years and then to make it permanent. How do you think rich people voted? I mean, everybody say yes. Nobody would vote to raise their own taxes. All of them voted for it. If you look county by county through California, you will find that rich people in the richest county voted to raise their own taxes. People don't vote to make themselves rich. If people voted to make themselves rich, we would be living in laissez capitalist heaven because nothing makes people richer faster than capitalism. People don't vote pocketbook issues. People vote morality. People vote what they think is right. They vote what makes them feel good and they associate feeling with morality. And morality tells them sacrifice is good and, and uh, equality is wonderful. And you can see this on campuses. If you go on campuses, they're not worried about the tuition. They're worried about those transgender kids who are not to be treated exactly right. They're worried about uh, me coming on campus and you know, being a fascist or whatever. That's what they're worried about. They're not worried about their tuition. You, you see the demonstrations in Berkeley and, and in the United States. Those aren't demonstrations to lower tuition. Those are demonstrations to shut people up no, because they don't like their ideas. Yeah, but my point, if you're a student and you're offered that chance that your tuition fees are going to be reduced... If you're a rich guy and you're offered to vote not to raise your taxes, how are you going to vote? People don't behave that way. People vote something deeper. Okay. Well, the second point is about National Socialism. Yeah. Is there a socialist? Yes. In fact, uh, it wasn't socialism. The uh, left wing at the Na Nazi party were exterminated in 1934 at the uh, long yeah, no, So I he was never, Hitler was anti-socialist, anti-Bolshevik. So I don't think you can compare. You uh, can compare. They're the same. They're different. They're, they're, they are differences. I agree that fascism and socialism are different in superficial ways. But in the deep fundamental way, they're exactly the same. Both advocate for the collective over the individual. Both require a supreme leader in order to channel the will of the collective so we all know who needs to be sacrificed. They are the exact same thing. I mean, this is why I hate the, the label right and left. It, it, right and left are the same. They are ultimately collectivist, uh, pro-sacrifice, anti-individualistic. That's the Nazis, that's the socialists, it's the same thing. Now, it's true, the Nazis didn't believe in state ownership of the means of production. They believed in state control over the means of production. What's the difference between control and ownership? We're quibbling now, very little. So the communists took it over, the, the, the fascists said, eh, we're gonna leave the CEO in place, but we're gonna tell him how to run the business, we're gonna control everything that he does. That's the difference between fascism and socialism. And to say one is more evil than the other is bizarre. Because they're both just as evil and they're both philosophically indistinguishable. Well, indistinguishable. All, I, all I know is that the socialist part of the Nazi party mostly yes. was exterminated yes. in Yes, because Hitler didn't want to take over the means of production and he killed all. all anybody who viewed as an opponent, he killed them. It could be added. Joseph Goebbels was a left-wing socialist yeah. to the end of his life, Absolutely. wrote lots of articles against capitalism, made speeches against capitalism, was, was never reined in by Hitler. Yeah, and, and, and the Nazis were never pro-capitalist. I mean, there was no, no, no sense. They were fascists and communists, and, and the communists and fascism are equally distant from capitalism. And, and this is the thing. I don't want any, any piece of them, right? So I'm a purist. Going back to the point, right? I'm a purist. So I, I don't believe there's an axis 
going from left to right. I believe there's left right and then there's capitalism and individualism over here. It's a third dimension. And I don't want any piece of those in my capitalism thing because I think any piece of it taints what is possible. And is, and is less than, than, than ideal. And why settle for less than ideal? And I, I think you don't get the ideal unless you fight for it. The left is very good at this, right? They, they, they fight for an ideal 50 years in advance, and then they chip away and they get to it at the end. So socialized medicine was a dream, and they slowly chipped away and they finally got it. By the way, you mentioned Hayek. Uh, you, should, you should see a Road to Surf, Ayn Rand's copy of Road to Serfdom and all her marginalia comments on the side. It's <laughs> very imagine. entertaining, yeah. <laughs> so first, uh, thank you very much for your talk, it was great. And second, what is your, your view about the free G for Muslim country, which many of them don't support human rights, gay rights, women rights? And I met them here, refugee or Muslim sure. uh, immigrant who came to this country, and they don't support our women rights. So what is your view? So I think, I think you have to divide the issue into two here. I, I don't believe you should have an immigration policy that says, policy that says we're going to have an uh, ideological test at the border. And if you pass the test, you can come in. If you don't pass the test, you can't come in. Because then you're giving the government massive power over which ideology is okay and which ideology is not okay. I don't trust the government to provide health care. I certainly don't provide the government to, to figure out what ideology is. I mean, I would be excluded. My ideology would be perceived too radical to be allowed into the United States, right? Um, on the other hand, you can't allow just mass immigration into a territory with no constraints, like what is going on today in Europe. You can't, and, and, and there's a refugee crisis. It's not just a natural flow of immigration, which I have nothing against. I'm talking about millions of people suddenly showing up at your shore. Even if you had a laissez-faire country, complete capitalism, my ideal, right? Even then you wouldn't allow it because the land will all be private. And where would these people go? Where, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be a, you, you would have to stop them from violating people's property rights. So in a, in a mixed economy today, it's harder because there's a harder justification. But you cannot allow masses of people just in. Now, add to that, the weird war. Now, we don't recognize that we're at war. We have declared war. We pretend we're not at war. But we're at war, right? And if you define the enemy that we're at war with, then some of these people coming across are indistinguishable from that enemy. And during times of war, you have to do dramatic things. For example, shut the border down and say we can't let anybody in because some of the people coming in might be enemy agents. Like during World War II, I'm sure, there were significant restrictions of Germans coming to America. Certainly of Japanese. They were interned, after all, in America, which is legitimate. But they support the, the human life. Put aside the human rights, because I don't think that's relevant. Because I, my view is, if, if they were coming in in drips and drabs, if they were coming in slowly, then they would be assimilated. And, and if, now, I'll get to my second point about assimilation in a minute. They would be assimilated. Um, but my claim is right now we're at war with Islamists, with, uh, call it what you will. I like Islamic totalitarianism, uh, jihadism. Um, I don't believe we're at war with Islam. I think that's silly to say we're at war with Islam because that doesn't give you a political enemy to fight. Philosophically, sure, we're at war with Islam. But from a political perspective, we're at war with certain interpretations of Islam. Now, if we declared war, and I've been saying this since 9-11 or even before that, if we declared war, then you can put up walls, Walls are stupid, but you can you can put up restrictions and you can ban people from coming. But you first have to declare war. You have to identify these people are the enemy, and then, in my view, the war could be won very very quickly. Some of you heard my foreign policy stuff. I don't think it takes. It, I mean, we're talking about fighting people who have nothing. You could crush them in days. This is not hard stuff. This is not even North Korea, which is complicated. This is easy. I mean, the fact that ISIS still exists is, is a symbol forever of the pathetic weakness of the West. Pathetic. Do you know, it just drives me nuts, there's this convoy, Hezbollah, a terrorist Islamist organization, cut a deal with ISIS because Hezbollah was beating the crap out of ISIS, but they wanted a ceasefire, and they let, this is on the border with Lebanon, and they let ISIS evacuate the territory and go to Iraq. So ISIS got themselves and their families into, into buses 
and they're traveling across Syria. Everybody knows this, across Syria to the Iraqi border. You got ISIS fighters right there. Now, I'm president, or with a button, I bomb every single one of those buses and kill everybody. I mean, it's sad that their families are there, but it's their families, right? I don't consider that innocence. I mean, I feel sorry for the kids, right? But that's war. No, what, what is Americans doing? They're bombing the road as the buses move forward. They're putting potholes in the road so the buses can't move. They won't bomb the bus, because that would be, you know, immoral. They're, they're bombing the road. That's war? I mean, that's absurd. So either go to war and win, or don't go to war, stay home. Right? I, I, what, what I hate, you know, it's like the mixed economy. What I hate is this mixture. I've been going to war, but I'm, I'm not going to kill anybody. Right? I'm going to pretend that I can run a humane war, as if there is such a thing. The only kind of war that, that you should fight is a, is, a, is a war in self-defense, and then you should win it. And winning it means the unpleasantness of killing a lot of people. But that, so you have to declare war. You have to close the borders for the period of the war, and you have to make restrictions about mass migration. You can't have mass migration. Now, what's the right number? It's hard to tell. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the country. But clearly, it can't be the kind of numbers we're getting today. America, in my view, has no excuse, because there's no mass migration. There's no problem with immigration in the United States. I mean, it's all demagogy of, of Ann Coulter and Donald Trump. There's no, there's no crime problem of illegal immigrants. There's no mass, net immig illegal immigration into the United States over the last 10 years is negative. More immigrants left, more illegal immigrants went back to Mexico after the financial crisis than have come back since. Nobody talks about that. Uh, there are no statistics about crime among illegals, so nobody really knows one way or the other, but, but it's not out of control like Donald Trump presents it. There's just so much nonsense about this immigration. Oh, I had the other point was, and then I'll shut up. Um, I blame the lack of assimilation in the West, on the West. The problem is that we do not advocate for anything. We don't stand for anything. Now, unequivocally, Western civilization, now Western civilization, just to be clear, because these days you have to be, has nothing to do with race, has nothing to do with geography, has to do with ideas that happen to come from Greece and who knows what race those people were? Probably Asian, Central Asia, probably. And it's probably not the same people who are there today. Who cares? It's ideas. It has to do with ideas. Western civilization is the best civilization in human history. The ideas discovered primarily in Greece and in the Enlightenment are the ideas that drive human flourishing and human success and human prosperity anywhere they're tried. When the Chinese adopt a little bit of them, they do well. When the Japanese get the, the, in their constitution, General, I don't know if you know the story of how the Japanese constitution was written by General MacArthur and he crammed it down their throat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he didn't get the tribal leaders of Japan to sit around and devise a constitution. He wrote it for them, him and his assistant. And it's the only, it's the only constitution in the world that has the right to the pursuit of happiness in it. In the United States, it's in the Declaration of Independence. It's in the constitution. Guess what? Because they have that kind of language in the Constitution and a legal structure accordingly, they've done phenomenally well in Japan relative to other Asian countries. So we have, we have the secret sauce that humanity has been looking for for thousands of years. And instead of telling the Muslims, look, you can live like us. You just, just read Locke and, 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 and read Adam Smith and you know, and read the Founding Fathers of America and, you know, read Iran in my view, but, you know, read this stuff. This is the truth. This is what will make you happy and prosperous. And, it's, and we've tried it. And look how rich we are. And look, how, look at Michelangelo and look at the beauty we created. Look at all these wonderful things that we've done with the world. Instead of that, we say, no, your culture is just as good as ours. You, you guys, go ahead. I mean, I was sworn in as an American citizen in 2003. And George Bush comes up on this massive screen, right? Um, and he says, you know, this is the speech he gives to all these ceremonies, and he says, uh, cherish your culture and teach your kids about your culture. And I'm going, if I wanted to cherish my culture and teach my kids about it, I would have stayed in Israel. I don't want my culture. I reject my culture. I escape my culture. I don't want that. I came to America because I want to be an American. Celebrate what it means to be an American, not my culture. Now, yeah, we're multiculturalists. Italians bring on the pizza. 
Chinese bring on the you know bring the elements that are good and drop the stuff that's garbage and unfortunately Islam modern Islam has very little good to offer the world so drop it and we should be saying that it, it's not a matter of putting a gun to their head and demanding it it's enough to just say it to just have a moral backbone and say we have what it takes to flourish as a human being drop the nonsense and yeah, the first generation immigrants won't get it. But the second will get some of it. And the third by the third, if you look at all the stats by the third, they're pretty much completely assimilated when you have a backbone, when you advocate for something. And the problem with immigration today is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is an evil doctrine of egalitarianism, of equality. It's like socialism for, the, for culture. And it's just as evil. And as long as we are multiculturalists, it's our fault. So when, when people accuse immigrants of this or that, I go, no, our fault. It, we, you know, in, in America, second and third generation Latinos are <laughs> flying Mexican flags and chanting, we want Mexico, right? Why? Because their parents didn't do that because their parents risked their lives to come to America. Because they go to school and in the schools they're told that America stole the land from the Mexicans and the Americans are evil and bad and they should be proud of their Mexican heritage and Mexico is just as good as America. Then they go out into the streets and wave their flags. It's ideas drive history. So, but you know, if, if we told them what we told them in the past, which is, yeah, it's probably true that America engaged in some wars it shouldn't have had and took some territory it shouldn't have happened. But you know what? You are better off for it because you live in the, in the freest land in the, in the world. And it doesn't matter if you're brown or black or white or green or yellow or orange. What matters is your freedom and you can make the most of your life because of the American system of government. And isn't that a beautiful, wonderful thing and you should celebrate that. And Mexico, do you really want to live in the slums of uh, Guadalajara? Thank you. Yeah. And I, I should, sorry, let me look in this direction. I haven't looked in this direction. I've got a bite. I, 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 um, you said you have a free pass if you've got a touch five years old. Yes. That's great. Uh, I'm under 25. Well, I go. don't do that. So that's uh, a bit more generous of you than myself. Well, generally when debating people, you should be nice. Yes. And I know it's hard when you're young to be nice. I wasn't when I was young. I was an asshole. Um, and I, because I thought I knew the truth and every, everybody who didn't, I was going to bang them over the head with the truth until they got it. But that's not a good way. So treat everybody nicely. It's, it's probably good. Oh, yeah. But that being said, yes. um, quite a lot of my friends are talking about some young people and there is this idealist issue. Yeah. Um, I'm a lot more leaning towards your side of the argument. Yeah. But they, it's, it's quite interesting, there's a sick irony going on in the sense that they are very often, in my group anyway, are the sons and daughters of very wealthy, oh, self-made people absolutely. who will then vote and support policies, which they'll be fine. Their yeah. bank and mum and dad will support yes. them through it, but it's ultimately poor people who yes. support that through yes. the sorts of social mechanics you described. But on the other side of things, they, when I debate them, they say to me that, um, you know, there's this issue of what did Britain look like before the NHS? Back then, you know, you had the south of London, which was, you know, relatively wealthier, and you had in the Midlands and the north, where it was almost like a third world country. Yeah. Um, you know, you had children, you know, a statistic, I can't remember off the top of my head, but that's the number of kids not living past the age of five. It was atrocious. Yeah. And so, I, you know, let's say fair, and there's mechanics, and it's science, it's not the most mystery of where, where wealth comes from with a free economy, but I, I mean, as, as, can you help me destroy the validity that they have in saying that? If we freed up markets and sort of to make the NHS more the inverse towards the American system, they say that we would drop the ball and hurt quite a few people. Why what do you, would you say to them? Why, why do you think? So, um, I mean, a lot of things you could say to that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of arguments. Uh, but, but, but just from a purely kind of economic argument, if you show any one of those kids an iPhone and say, um, what did you think this would look like if the government designed it? it was. Yeah, I mean, they'd be, they, they'd laugh and they'd think, oh, yeah, it would be horrible. It wouldn't even function. It would be massive. And they say, well, what do you think is more important, healthcare or the iPhone? Oh. And they say, healthcare. And why do you want the government who can't even design a simple, stupid little iPhone to design something so complex and deal with something so difficult like healthcare? And that gets them thinking, at least. The fact is that in every single area of human endeavor, when the market is left alone, it produces better, cheaper, more widespread prosperity than anything government can ever do. 
whether it's in technology, which is the least regulated industry we have today, and it's where all the innovation is happening, or, 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 or any field, or whether it was, um, uh, I I imagine what flight had be, would have been like, the first airplanes would have been like, if you'd had a regulatory environment like Boeing and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Airbus have to live under today. You would have never gotten off the ground. Imagine if Thomas Edison in his laboratory had to have the safety, if he'd had inspectors coming in and telling him to wear his goggles, right, all the time. He would have never invented what he invented. So in every field, when you free up the human mind and you free up human, when you free up human ability, when you leave people alone, they succeed beyond our imagination and beyond my dreams. One of my arguments is always, I don't know what a purely private healthcare system will look like. Because I don't have a good enough imagination. I could have never come up with an iPhone. If you'd asked me, what will a smartphone look like? <laughs> Worse than the government probably, right? I, I just don't have that imagination. It's just not, I'm not Steve Jobs. That's the beauty of it. I don't have to be Steve Jobs. So what will the healthcare look like under a free market? I don't know. But what I do know, it'll be competitive. It'll be cheap. It'll have various quality and price points. It will be accessible to everybody because how many people don't have a smartphone today? Can I just make a point about the healthcare sure. point you're making? Because if you, I work in healthcare. Yeah. If you have healthcare systems based on a profit motive, yeah. then you will generate invariably greater technologies that will address the treatment of disease. But yeah. actually, if you look at evidence, it shows that the majority of diseases are purely preventable by lifestyle changes yeah. and public health interventions yeah. that, that actually do not, that do not uh, generate safety. And actually, the but greatest healthcare gains could be through social and education programs that are not based on. Again, that's just a lack of imagination. Imagine if I open a practice, a healthcare practice, that said exactly what you just said. It turns out that most diseases are preventable, and I'm going to teach you how to do this. And all I want is a retainer. I want you to pay me 50 bucks a month, and I'm going to help you find a, a trainer. Uh, or, or exercise program, and I'm going to help you with nutrition, I'm going to help you with these things, and, and I'm just going to charge a set fee, and, uh, and if that is true, and I'm not going to argue the point whether diseases are preventable or not, because that's a scientific point, not a political point, if that is true, then that model will work, and it will drive a lot of conventional medicine out of business. So, yeah, who's going to, be, who's going to do better at educating us about healthcare, do you think, the private sector or government? Now, I know the American government, I don't know how the British government does it, but I, I, I know that one week uh, butter is evil and will kill you, the next week uh, margarine is evil and will kill you, and then the third week butter is actually pretty good for you because saturated fat is actually good, but then no, this are, and, and, and then when you actually investigate what's actually going on, at least in America, it turns out that it depends on who, who lobbied that week, right? So uh, if it's the cattle industry that was lobbying, then butter is really good. And if you know, and then of course, medicine itself is evolving, and our knowledge of medicine is evolving. I don't want authorities telling me and forcing it. So when the government does it, it really impacts people. They have a food pyramid. I think the food pyramid is bullshit, based on the research I've done. I might be wrong. I don't. I, I'm not an expert. But to the best of my knowledge, eating a bunch of grains is not that good for you. And maybe why we're so obese in America is because we've been eating. Great for breakfast, great for lunch, and great for dinner. Maybe, maybe not, but maybe, right? But why have a government food pyramid? You know, have competing pyramids. Have people have different practices and compete for these things. Let's figure it out. Let the marketplace work these things out. The marketplace is a million times better in everything that doesn't involve force than government will ever be because what the marketplace does is it rewards thinking. And when we look at private medicine today and say this is how it behaves, yeah, this is how it behaves in a highly regulated, highly distorted, government-dominated marketplace. We have no clue what a truly private healthcare system would look like because none exists in the world. But in areas where there is private healthcare, for example, in veterinary care, veterinary care, right? Pets in America, it's a big deal. I don't know if, if here, you know, you, you guys have complex operations on cats and dogs. <laughs> because insurance doesn't cover it and because it's not heavily regulated by the government and because you don't have all these BS stuff, prices have gone down, quality has gone through the roof and accessible to almost everybody. Even poor people who have pets get fancy stuff done to those pets. 
uh, LASIK surgery, which is not covered by insurance and not regulated by government, or regulated mildly by government in the United States, dropped dramatically in price and quality has gone through the roof. I want that on everything. Now, I know that because I've got insurance in the United States, in my view, I get the best health care in the world, bar none. I would, if, if I had something happen to me right here in England, I would get on a plane and suffer a flight back to America so I would not have to go to one of your hospitals. <laughs> it's, I mean, I grew up in Israel, my father's a doctor in socialized medicine, he, he, worked, he worked in Hackney for two and a half years, here in England for a while, and uh, in the old days when, uh, when that part of London wasn't very uh, hip as it is today, um, I don't want socialized medicine, it's not good for you, it kills people, and in England it's killing a lot of people every single day, and this is the real cost, the cost is death. There is no bigger cost than that. As an individualist, that is horrifying. So I'm not giving up on the NHS. I'm going to slam it every opportunity I have because it kills people. And a, and a private health care system doesn't kill people. People will still die, but far fewer people and for innocent mistakes, not, for, not systemically, not because they're waiting for an MRI. I needed an MRI the other day. I called in the morning. Within three hours, I got an MRI. And it cost me $400. Most people can afford $400 if they have to have a memoir. Now, history is complicated, right? I don't know the history of the NHS. I, when was it founded? Uh, it's David Lloyd George, so it's like 1948, after the war. So it's hard to tell. So it's hard to tell the state of, of the relative health care, how much of it was because of the war and, and so on. I'd have to study the history. But I can tell you things like people tell me, um, so. Uh, OSHA in America is this uh, government entity that regulates workplace safety. And they show you charts, and the charts show here's OSHA, past, and safety in terms of number of deaths so, or injuries on the workplace has gone like that. So everybody says, well, look, OSHA's an incredible success. How can you argue against OSHA? What you do is you show them the full graph. So it turns out that if you go 100 years before OSHA, Right? A lot of people were dying in the workplace. Workplaces were relatively unsafe. Technology didn't exist. People didn't really know what they were doing. And it's been going like this ever since. And the fact that OSHA was introduced had no impact on the slope of the graph. So I wonder if you looked at the same thing about child mortality. Were the changes in child mortality coming to that point? Did, did NHS really change or was that a trend that was happening anyway? And even if, it, even if NHS did change something, at what cost? Who suffered? Right? It's, not, it's, it's not free. So one has to, if you actually want to do the history, one has to dig into the history and figure out what the facts really are. And then, again, look at the reality today. And the reality today is you don't have a good healthcare system. I mean, even as compared to your European neighbors, who also have types of socialized medicine, they're better than the NHS. The NHS is one of the worst in the world. And it's, it's not a good place to be in. From Australia, the Australian system is way better than yeah. on here. It's, yeah, it's, really, it's really bad. Yeah, and, 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 and the one in Singapore is even better than the one in Australia. So they are, and the one in Singapore relies 100% on private insurance. And now it's, it's a form of universal health care, but it's all private insurance. There's no government provided health care. It's all provided by the private sector. Um, but you have to have insurance. We don't have time for more questions, unfortunately. So. We have to be out of here. Yeah. Okay, sorry, guys. Thank you all. Thank you.